Herzlich willkommen alle zusammen zu diesem Workshop. Liebe Kolleginnen, liebe Kollegen, liebe Freundinnen, liebe Freunde, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich möchte Sie ganz herzlich begrüßen zu unserer Panel-Diskussion die Hierarchisierung des Lebens und die Herausforderung der Solidarität. Und ganz besonders begrüße ich unsere Gäste. Da sind zum einen Johanna Kistner, Johanna Kistner von, aus Johannesburg, Südafrika. Dann Seina Amar aus Beirut, Libanon. Und Neros Duman aus Hanau hier in Deutschland. A very special welcome to our guests. We are really very happy and thankful that you could be with us, even on a Saturday. Ja, wir sind ein ganz besonders herzliches Willkommen an unsere Gäste. Wir freuen uns wirklich sehr und sind dankbar, dass ihr bei uns seid, sogar an einem Samstag. Mein Name ist Usche Merck. Ich bin Fachreferentin für psychosoziale Arbeit bei Medico International und werde uns durch diese Veranstaltung leiten. Meine Kollegin Julia Manek wird den Chat und die Fragen moderieren und dann in die Diskussion reintragen. Ja, und nun zum Inhalt. Wir wollen heute die Frage diskutieren, wie sich die Corona-Krise auf die psychosoziale Dynamik und die psychosoziale Arbeit auswirkt und dabei eine Perspektive einnehmen, die nach gesellschaftlichen Prozessen der Hierarchisierung von Leben fragt und danach, was das für die Solidarität und, die, und für kollektive psychosoziale Prozesse bedeutet. Wir haben dafür drei Frauen eingeladen, die alle aus einer ganz besonderen Perspektive die Corona-Krise erleben und reflektieren, weil sie mit Menschen arbeiten, die extrem marginalisiert, ausgegrenzt, die als andere gelabelt werden und von denen in diesen Tagen der täglichen Corona-Berichterstattung kaum oder niemals die Rede ist. Joanna Kistner arbeitet in Südafrika beim Sophia Town Community Psychological Services in der Megametropole Johannesburg, einem städtischen Umfeld mit über 10 Millionen Einwohnern, mit extrem armen und ausgegrenzten Communities, darunter vielen afrikanischen Flüchtlingen und Migrantinnen, insbesondere Frauen und Kindern, die in den innerstädtischen Elendsvierteln in kaputten Wohnblocks oder Abbruchhäusern wohnen. Seine Amar arbeitet beim Anti-Racism Movement in Beirut, Libanon, einer anderen Metropole mit über zwei Millionen Einwohnern und Hunderttausenden von Flüchtlingen und Migrantinnen, darunter Zehntausende von Hausangestellten, auch aus vielen afrikanischen Ländern. Beirut ist nicht nur von einer gravierenden ökonomischen und politischen Krise geprägt, sondern wurde am 4. August auch von einer riesigen Explosion getroffen, die 300.000 Menschen obdachlos machte, darunter zahlreiche migrantische Hausangestellte. Und Neros Duman äh, aus Hanau, einer kleineren Stadt innerhalb der Rhein-Main-Metropole, arbeitet bei der Initiative 19. Februar, einer ganz besonderen Initiative, die nach dem rassistischen Terroranschlag am 19. Februar 2020, bei dem neun junge Menschen ihr Leben ließen, gegründet wurde, um für die vielen hundert Familienangehörigen, Freundinnen, Kolleginnen und Community-Nachbarn einen Ort zu schaffen, an dem sie sich austauschen und trauern können, aber auch sichtbar werden und ihre Forderungen kommunizieren können. Wir haben uns vorgenommen, alle drei Referentinnen zu fragen, was die Corona-Krise für ihre Arbeit und die Menschen, mit denen sie arbeiten, bedeutet, welche Folgen und Auswirkungen sie hat, insbesondere in Bezug auf emotionale und psychosoziale Dynamiken. Und wir haben sie gefragt, welche Auswirkungen die Corona-Krise und insbesondere der Lockdown und das Social Distancing oder genauer das physische Distanzieren auf ihre Arbeit hat, besonders darauf, dass sie alle, so unterschiedlich der Kontext auch sein mag, ihre, ihre Arbeit mit kollektiven solidarischen Prozessen und Praxis verbinden. Praxen verbinden. Für den Ablauf haben wir uns jetzt Folgendes vorgestellt. 
In der ersten Stunde möchten wir zunächst den drei Referentinnen Gelegenheit geben, ihre Arbeit, ihre Beobachtungen und Reflexionen mit je einem Input vorzustellen. Und nach jedem Input wird es Gelegenheit für Fragen an die jeweiligen Referentin, die jeweilige Referentin geben. Und in der zweiten Stunde wollen wir dann stärker gemeinsam mit dem Panel und mit Fragen aus dem Publikum die gemachten Beobachtungen analysieren und uns über Umgangsstrategien austauschen, über notwendige Ansätze, sowohl in der konkreten Arbeit und Strategien als auch im Umgang mit der Corona-Krise selbst, über Veränderungsoptionen und welche Rolle auch transnationale Solidarität spielen kann. Als Erste wird jo Johanna Kistner vortragen. Johanna ist Psychologin und Leiterin des Sophia Town Community Psychological Services, das sie zusammen mit KollegInnen nach den massiven xenophoben Ausschreitungen in Johannesburg 2008 gegründet hat. Johanna hat eine lange Geschichte der Arbeit mit Betroffenen von Gewalt, Rassismus, Sexismus und Marginalisierung schon seit der Apartheid. Sie ist eine Pionierin in der Entwicklung von innovativen und kreativen Ansätzen, wie psychologisches Wissen und Erfahrung mit Gemeinwesenarbeit und politischem Aktivismus in Verbindung gebracht werden können. Und sie ist auch Teil eines afrikanischen Netzwerks von psychosozialen Akteurinnen, die das westliche Traumamodell in Frage stellen und alternative Ansätze entwickeln. Johanna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. So, yes, as Ute um, introduced me, I'm a psychologist, but I have to admit I'm an aging psychologist and I have worked in communities for so long that I've kind of lost my formal psychological academic language and I'm just going to talk to you the way things happen in our context. Before we go into what, what COVID has done to, to the communities in which we as an organization work, we should maybe talk a little bit about the, what the pre-COVID realities are. Um, also just to explain that I run a small non-governmental organization that focuses, that has two main centers. One go, really goes into the South African communities in and around Soweto. So a lot of informal settlements and works primarily with the impact of HIV AIDS, poverty, um, gender violence and all those legacies. And then in a city as a result of the xenophobic violence in 2008, we established a center um, that focuses mainly on migrants and refugees. And in our particular area, they are mainly actually asylum seekers from the DRC, some from the Congo, some from Burundi, and then also from Zimbabwe. Um, so that's just um, a little bit of background. But back to pre-COVID realities, in a way, COVID did not change our realities, it just made them more extreme. Our realities are pre-COVID that already 10% of the population holds 86% of its wealth, which is very similar to the apartheid stats um, where we used to say that 13% of the country's land was held by 86% of, um, sorry, 13% of the people held 86% of its land. 60% um, of household depend on social grants, um, which is an enormous amount um, of people who simply cannot survive without social grants and social grants are very minimal. 54% um, of households do not have access to clean water. Um, we have an unemployment rate of about 30%. Um, and 50% youth unemployment rate. Um, it is said that 55% live in poverty on the upper poverty line and 25% experience food poverty, so the lower poverty line. And um, depending on what you know of South African history, those inequalities persist along the lines of race and gender. Um, even though there have been improvements 
in some sectors, um, but inequality still persists mainly around the, the, the lines of the race and gender. Can we have the next one? Then we deal with the cost of state capture, um, which is a word that I don't know if that's a word that's common in other um, countries, but for us state capture means um, the conspiracy between business and politicians to, to hijack the country's decision-making process to, in order to, um, put, to, put, to improve their own interests. And they do this by weakening laws and agencies that enforce them. So what's happened in South Africa, especially in the era of the last president for about 10 years, that there's been a massive um, capture of the state by politicians conspiring with um, with corporates and with corrupt businesses to um, acquire wealth, which means in effect that 1.5 trillion rands have been stolen from the country. Um, most of this during the second term of the Zuma administration. And that amounts to one third of the domestic gross domestic, gross domestic product that has just been wiped out. Um, as part of all of that, and what has made that possible is an increasingly fragmented political leadership and an almost, well, the way we see it, complete breakdown of governance structures at all levels, whether it's at national, um, provincial or local, and a complete breakdown of accountability which then makes space for impunity for the violation of human rights, um, in particular in the public service. Um, the failure of government to provide basic services is in part directly due to this, the capture of the state. Um, and that gives rise to um, service delivery protests. During COVID, they've been less, but on average, they're about 300 service delivery protests, which we, which are mainly town protests in, in formerly black townships and informal settlements, um, where people express their anger at the lack of infrastructure, the lack of electricity, the lack of um, proper schooling, proper school infrastructure, the lack of roads. And fortunately, that anger is often projected at foreign nationals. And that leads to xenophobic attacks, um, which are quite regular events and are often um, supported by the police and other law enforcing agencies. So there's a, um, a complete impunity around um, prosecuting people who have attacked foreign nationals mainly shops and business, small businesses of foreign nationals. Okay, can we have the next slide? So I want to talk a bit more about xenophobia because it is what um, I directly personally work with all the time because I work mainly with the asylum seekers from the DRC. Um, xenophobia, as I said, is systemically entrenched. Um, it is really fermented by all political parties. We had elections last year, was it? Yeah, last year. Um, and every single political party um, advocated for closure of borders, um, for closer migration controls, in fact, for an exclusion of foreign nationals from, from business opportunities, from making a living. Um, but although the, the violent attacks take the kind of get to the headlines um, and to social media, most of the violence actually takes place in those quiet unseen spaces where women and children um, seek help. So mainly in hospitals, in clinics, in schools, and it takes the form of verbal abuse. Um, of, of denying people access to services, of corrupt um, practices of asking for money for services that should be free to everybody. Um, and in particular, services that help people get documentation. Without documentation, people have no rights. Um, 
services to health, to education, to protection from violence and abuse and to social grants. And of course, like, like always, women and children are the most vulnerable. And in our work, we may work mainly with women and children because um, most of them, most women are single breadwinners in households where the men are absent. And just briefly about the politics of the COVID response, it's exposed deeply entrenched authoritarianism of the state. Um, I mean, one example very quickly is that in July, which was the height of our infection, the peak of our infection rate, um, some of the restrictions were lifted and we could buy clothes again, but own, not t-shirts and not open sandals because it was winter. And if we were to buy a t-shirt, we had to prove that we would wear it under a jersey. Um, and with it, um, I'm going to just look at the Black Lives Matter. It was the time of George Floyd, um, which was, and the Black Lives Matter was quickly appropriated um, for political purposes. But at the same time, as George Floyd was killed, South African police killed 12 people um, for minor violations of, of COVID regulations. There's been corruption at all levels from PPE to food distribution. Um, the the vul most vulnerable groups have been even further violated. And I mean, I could talk about this for the whole day, but um, laws or regulations have now been passed in our, in our province, not in the whole country, that all foreign nationals, asylum seekers, now need to pay for hospital services as private patients, which means that effectively the people we work with are dying because they cannot afford um, private rates. Um, just, there was also um, incredible vulnerability to political pressure. So while we wouldn't buy sandals as a, as a public, um, we could drive in, ta in taxis that were 100% full. Um, during the height of the COVID pandemic. So the social consequences. Um, the pandemic was initially racialized as white. It's a white people's problem. So people didn't take it very seriously. Um, and, but it's a very soon became um, extreme hunger um, was defining um, how people responded to it. So the kind of attitude that hunger kill, will kill me before, long before COVID that we've heard all over the world was part of our discourse as well. Migrant communities tended to be more compliant, especially the women and children, because they were very afraid of police and soldiers. And um, South Africans, in a way it was in the townships, I think it was an act of defiance. Um, I was just at a funeral and all the women wore masks and none of the men. Um, it's almost like an act of defiance. This doesn't apply to us. We, we will not follow the rules because the rules actually don't give us anything. It, it soon emerged that there were no food reserves in household. School nutrition programs were suspended. So the, what, the children who depended on that one meal at school didn't get it anymore. Families were locked in with each other in tiny spaces. And none of our children had access to digital means of communication and learning, um, which also meant that they remained extremely isolated. All street trading was prohibited and migrant families were excluded from food relief. But even, even South Africans who theoretically qualified for food relief None of our communities that we worked with, actually nobody received a single food parcel. And we believe that this is largely due to corruption at a local level and at a ward level. Social and child protection services were suspended. Um, home affairs offices remained closed. And by the way, social services are still in effect suspended. There are no social workers. Schooling was completely disrupted and many of our clients have been extremely intimidated by legal and illegal landlords in the inner city ghettos. Access to psychosocial support and legal services, which are already very, very scarce, continues to be extremely limited. We are one of the few 
um, organizations that opened has been present in the community again since May. Most of the partner organizations are still working on Zoom and we didn't really believe that that works. And then we, recently we have had um, accounts and clients affected by large um, we're coming in with narratives of exploitation by large criminal syndicates, in particular around baby farming, organ trafficking and drug trafficking. So women basically giving their bodies um, to be inseminated um, at, in order to fall pregnant and then selling their babies. The psychosocial impact has been intense anxiety primarily about food security and fear of eviction and violence, reactivation of traumatic memories. Um, many of our clients come from um, war zones and have, have um, survived massacres and mass rapes. And seeing the soldiers and the police on the street has reactivated memories. And it's been very difficult for them to distinguish between um, the anxiety that is associated with those memories and a realistic assessment of the present. Depression, loss of hope and giving up, just sleeping, no longer even trying to get food. Loss of agency and a sense of mastery that comes with being able to provide for a family. And in terms of our work, a lot of our clients expressed that during the time of the very hard lockdown when we were not there, there was a loss of sense of belonging to the support offered by extended families, churches, and in particular, psychosocial support services. There's increased persecutory and suicidal ideation. We can't go to the clinic. We won't test because they will give us an injection to kill us. Um, children were particularly affected in terms of their development. There was no outlet for any form of exercise. Um, with four or five families sharing a room, children were literally um, left immobile, which in, in turn created a huge um, frustration and anger and built up of, of rage, um, which now takes the form of behavioral problems. Children no longer trust, trust adults who keep on saying, especially in relation to schooling, you can go back to school and then schools are closed again and then schools are open. And since schools are closed again, um, schools for children are those places where they feel to a large extent, safe and where they have an outlet for their energies and, and their needs. And generally a regression and loss of previously attained self-regulatory and interpersonal skills. So in terms of our work, I think it's well known by now and well documented that mental health is, can be seen as another aspect of the pandemic, which is gonna last much longer than the pandemic itself. Um, for us, it's been very important that uh, after the very hard lockdown, we were declared an essential service so that psychosocial services should be seen as essential services. We also learned that digital communication can never replace the power of a face-to-face -face relationship. And in fact, many of our clients, as they came back into the, into the center, expressed expressed relief that they were able to, to see the face again and, and um, have the safe space, the physical safe space in which they can share their problems. It, COVID has diversified our already very diverse responsibilities. So we are not just psychologists, we are also social workers and food providers. And um, we search for money for rent so that people don't get evicted. We um, facilitate access to schooling. And yeah, COVID has, has made us also into a humanitarian aid organization, which we have tried to resist for a long time. We have to hold a hunger anger. Um, a lot of clients come in and say they are so hungry, but often it comes out as angry. And we, the, the anger that comes with hunger is also projected onto us and we have to Work, walk a very fine balance of being both the, the containers of emotion and the providers of 
at least a minimum of material relief. Um, we also, again, became aware of the importance of strengthening the wounded carer, including our own team who was equally stressed. Many of them were separated from their children in different countries and in different provinces. Um, and many of them have lost loved ones to the, to the pandemic. So a lot of time and effort had to go into supporting our, our team so that we could support our clients. We learned a lot about the negotiating, po negotiating power of, we call it e-wallets or instant cash transfers. And our clients had to learn how to use their cell phones to draw money. Um, but what they did, the negotiating power of e-wallet um, lies in the fact that even though it didn't, the amounts we could send to clients didn't pay the rent, but it gave them some negotiating power with landlords. Um, during the hard lockdown, it was very important for clients, for, for us to check in, even if it is on a very bad phone line, because it was important for them to know that we didn't forget them. Um, we focused very much on, on psychological first aid, on containing, on recreating a sense of belonging and connectedness, especially since we could be back in the physical space. And I think one of one of the most important things for me and for my team is that the consistency of physical and emotional presence, that no matter what, um, we are there and this is a safe place where even if it only gives you a sense of safety and security and belonging for an hour or two, it is the place that is always there. And it's the place from which you can then go out again and confront um, the stresses of the day. So we also developed a program called Creators Families in Lockdown. I think I'm probably out of, out of time, but that's especially in the center in the inner city where people could walk in and can walk in. We couldn't run groups anymore, so we invited households, so people who are living together anyway. Um, we, handed, we, we taught mothers how to play with their children um, initially, they wanted us to pay them for doing that, um, but it's become quite integrated into the families now. We gave out toys um, and games and art materials so that mothers can play with their children in, in those very crowded conditions and children have some, some relief of the extreme boredom. It gave us a lot of opportunities to connect with leadership. We, we run a leadership program as well in the NPO sector um, because leaders were isolated, um, tended to be in their homes while their frontline workers were in their organizations and but really, really stressed out and, and needing support. So we had our monthly and often more often meetings. Um, we develop, we set up counseling sessions for leaders and for team members across the sector. I think it also, the lockdown enhanced awareness of the fault lines in organizations, not just in the community or in the, <coughs> in the society. Um, and I think leaders have become much more aware of the responsibility to address these, especially around race and inequality and pay. It made it possible to network across provincial and national boundaries and to have in-depth dialogues and conversations within and beyond the sector. So quite deep reflections around who are we, what are we doing? What does the future hold? How do we deal with uncertainty and helplessness? And finally, I think, I hope, it did something to contribute towards the leveling of playing, the playing fields between frontliners such as us um, and funding agencies, because I think it did create a sense of at least international solidarity. I'm not so sure about national, but international solidarity um, that, yeah, we were not in the same boat and but we are in the same ocean and need to navigate the same kind of uncertainties and i think i'm going to stop with that thank you thank you very much joanna i know it's a huge task to talk about these serious 
challenging issues in, in a short space of time. Thank you very much. It looks as if there are no direct questions at the moment. We can just leave it there and, and, and just go to the next presentation and, and look at the bigger picture and um, move on to Zena. Zena is um, from, in, from Beirut in Lebanon. She's a, uh, ach so, Entschuldigung, muss ich wieder auf Deutsch um switchen. Ja, Zena Amar ist eine libanesische Feministin und seit 2010 in Community-Organisationen aktiv. Sie hat Public Policy an der Universität Oxford studiert und verschiedene Jobs in Regierungs- und Nichtregierungsorganisationen gehabt. Und seit 2019 ist sie Advocacy und Communications Managerin beim Anti-Racism Movement im Libanon. Sie organisiert außerdem jährliche Retreats über die Politik von Mental Health mit dem A-Project einer lokalen NGO. Zena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's actually very interesting because I can relate to a lot of what was already said. Let me just tell you a bit about the anti-racism movement. Uh, so it's a local non-governmental organization uh, that started in 2010 um, after uh, witnessing a lot of racial discrimination in beach resorts um, against domestic workers, preventing them either from entering the resort or from swimming in the pool or from wearing normal bathing suits. And so a group of feminists and migrant workers got together and uh, decided to uh, organize an anti-racist uh, anti movement. And this is um, how we started. Um, initially, our work was uh, focused primarily on uh, advocating against racism as um, a systemic problem. Um, so mostly to abolish the sponsorship system, which we call the kafala system that I will talk about uh, in a little bit. Um, and uh, so just to give you an overview uh, about our work before uh, COVID, before switching to after COVID. So uh, our main work was focused on uh, advocacy for the abolishment of the kafala system, but also uh, mainly on um, uh, providing support directly for migrant communities in Lebanon. So we had our uh, biggest project was the migrant community centers and we had uh, more than 500 members um, of the community centers. Uh, we had three centers across Lebanon that were open and that welcomed migrant workers as um, leaders of their own cause, and uh, we aim to support them in their self-advocacy, but also uh, to provide them with the physical space uh, to find each other and to build a safe space together, uh, to provide uh, language classes, computer classes, and any classes that they wish, and also to provide them with the space to have fun and to organize their, uh, their birthdays, their events, their holiday planning, whatever it is. And um, we miss all those smiles at our centers because right now, um, since April, 2020, we had to close down, unfortunately, due to uh, COVID-19. Um, and we did that with a very heavy heart. Um, and it's still very difficult to um, reconcile with the fact that our centers have closed down. And uh, only now we're trying, after uh, a lot of consultations with the communities, we're trying to open them up again uh, with bigger spaces, fewer people, a lot of, uh, a lot of rules um, to make them as safe as possible, but also, um, you know, not to prevent these communities from having these very valuable spaces um, that offer them uh, really a safety net that they very much need. So let me just give you a brief overview of lovely 2020. I know it was a challenging year for absolutely everyone, uh, but for Lebanon in particular, um, it was quite a year. Um, 
since September 2019, we started seeing um, early signs of impending economic collapse uh, due to the US dollar shortage in, uh, in our markets, in our banks, um, which means that the local currency really plummeted. And uh, until now, it lost more than 80% of its value, uh, which is quite drastic. Um, as a result of this, uh, a lot of the people who used to hire uh, migrant workers, especially migrant domestic workers, um, then uh, started to say that we can no longer afford the service, even though it is uh, quite undervalued and uh, quite cheap uh, relative to the service provided. Uh, but even uh, then, uh, they would say that they can no longer afford the service. So uh, there was a rising unemployment among migrant workers, especially domestic workers. Um, and even the workers who are still employed, uh, they either received their salaries in Lebanese pound, which, as I said, lost more than 80% of its value. Um, or uh, they did not receive their wages at all. Um, with the excuse uh, of employers being that we are providing you with shelter and food. Right now, we cannot pay. So the choice is either we leave you on the street and you fend for yourself, or we keep you here and you still work for us, but we cannot pay you anymore. Um, and this is the reality uh, today of a lot of people who are having to work without a wage and uh, the employers of domestic workers are being are doing this with complete impunity and really getting away with it without any condemnation for from the government and very little condemnation condemnation from uh, civil society um, and really radio silence from the international community which i think is quite shocking um, apart from that um, COVID-19 came and uh, really made the existing economic collapse even worse. Um, so we went through cycles of uh, lockdowns that were inconsistent and quite uh, arbitrary. Uh, we had this uh, very strange rule that said um, uh, cars with, uh, with uh, plate numbers that end in uh, even numbers uh, can uh, can be on the streets on uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, and cars with plate numbers with odd numbers can be on the streets on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So um, just to give you an, an example of how uh, the state was trying to get creative with, you know, reducing um, uh, the number of people crowding together, uh, but really arbitrarily and really failing to do so at the end of the day. Most families have two cars and uh, they, they use uh, each car on a different day and uh, the end result would be the same of people um, ending up uh, at their workplace overcrowding. Um, so the situation now is uh, quite severe uh, in terms of Corona. Um, our hospitals are already at more than 86% uh, occupancy rate, and uh, there are more and more cases every day. Uh, of course, as you might expect, um, the more vulnerable populations uh, would be migrant workers with limited access to healthcare, especially if they are undocumented, um, then they really have trouble uh, getting the care that they need. Um, and then to top it all off on uh, August 4, this was already mentioned, um, the port in Beirut <laughs> exploded due to uh, major corruption in the state that, that led to the storage of uh, ammonium nitrate in the most unsafe uh, ways. And um, due to this explosion, again, it really uh, made all of this crisis worse because the, the port was really the hub of uh, trade for uh, Beirut. Um, what I really wanted to stress is that all of this only made an already existing crisis um, just be, be much more apparent. So it exacerbated uh, a structural problem that already existed 
uh, when it comes to migrant domestic workers in Lebanon. So what is the system that we're talking about? It's the kafala system or the sponsorship system. And essentially it means that um, a migrant domestic worker is recruited by uh, an employer uh, and we call him the sponsor. And the sponsor's name goes on to the worker's visa as well as her uh, residency permit. Uh, which means that this one person, this one individual is in com complete control over her work status in the country, but also her legal status in the country. And uh, the regulation of this uh, domestic work is very limited because domestic work is not inclu included in the labor law, so they abs have absolutely no protections. The only mechanism to regulate it is the standard contract but even that has no enforcement mechanism. So I know it seems a bit abstract. Let me explain what this implies for people um, in their daily lives. So what this means is um, a domestic worker is working with her employer behind closed doors and nobody has any oversight over what happens behind these closed doors. So essentially the worker is at the mercy of the employer and uh, her, her working conditions uh, and her well-being uh, really depend on this uh, treatment by the employer. Um, as a result of this, a lot of employers uh, have complete impunity to abuse uh, workers uh, on many different levels. So the workers have extremely low wages. Um, there's systematic wage theft in the sense that uh, they work and work and at the end of the day, uh, they don't, at the end of the month, they don't get their wages and there's no way, uh, no real justice mechanism that migrant workers can access uh, in order to retrieve uh, their lost wages. Um, it's a very complicated system where the migrant worker really has to know her way around the system to be able to um, get her rights back. Um, they suffer from excessive working hours, sometimes working for several employers for one wage. Um, they have no family time. They're not allowed to carry a phone most of the time. They have poor medical attention. And as I said, behind closed doors, there's a lot of room for verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and it even reaches the stage of torture and murder at, in many of the cases. And unfortunately, a lot of the cases where uh, the death of uh, domestic workers is reported in the media, uh, it is reported as a suicide after a very brief uh, investigation by the police, whereas we know that a lot of these cases um, are not suicide, but uh, potentially murder. And even when they are suicide, um, it is very clear that the responsibility falls squarely on um, the harsh employment conditions and the employers themselves. Uh, and there's also forced labor and uh, human trafficking. Um, so as you can see, if you just look at the elements of this system as it is, it, as it is regardless of uh, Corona, you can, actually make a parallel with the lockdown um, that everybody else lives. Um, it's actually much worse than the lockdown that everybody is living under uh, Corona. And this is a point that the workers themselves have tried to, made, uh, to make after uh, a lot of Lebanese people started to complain after the lockdown. Um, because they cannot go out, because they cannot see their friends, they cannot see their family. Um, so domestic workers were trying to say, well, hey, this is our daily reality and this is how you treat us. And actually kafala is perpetual lockdown for us. Um, so uh, welcome to our life, uh, basically. Um, and this is really important to know that um, a uh, domestic worker uh, cannot legally quit uh, her job without her employer's approval before the end of her contracts. She needs her employer's consent. And um, if she ends up escaping uh, the harsh employment conditions uh, for whatever reason, uh, the worker automatically uh, loses her legal residency because her sponsor's name is on her papers. So she loses this uh, legal status automatically and she becomes at risk of arrest and uh, deportation. 
As a result, we have a lot of undocumented uh, migrant workers because they do end up escaping these harsh conditions and they become illegal uh, or uh, an irregular status. Um, and uh, here it's um, interesting to see that the, the, the lockdown, the corona lockdown particularly, has had different effects on uh, undocumented workers and documented workers, or if you want to translate it and in, in what it means in their, their daily life, it's the differentiation between workers who are still living within um, the employer's home. Um, and those are the documented workers and the uh, workers who have escaped their employer's home and we call them the freelancers or these are the workers who have become undocumented. And they are affected quite differently because if you are still uh, locked in uh, within your employer's home, um, then we have heard uh, report of uh, increased uh, domestic violence. Um, because your employer is locked in uh, with you all of a sudden 24-7. Whereas for uh, freelancers, the effects are quite different. Um, and what they've seen is an increase in, um, in homelessness because um, employers were not um, calling them in to, to work an hourly wage uh, to clean their houses because they were scared of Corona. So if the employers were quarantining, then suddenly freelance domestic workers um, lost a lot of their jobs, which means they had no income at the end of the day, which means that eventually a lot of them uh, either ended up being homeless because they could not pay rent anymore, or uh, they found each other and they, you know, if, if there were two separate apartments, each of them housing um, eight migrant workers in each house, uh, then they found uh, each other and they merged their houses in a way. So to pay one uh, rent at the end of the month. Uh, so now you have houses that are housing 16 migrant workers, 30 migrant workers um, and two bedroom. This lockdown can be seen at two different levels. Um, you have the lockdown uh, um, at the household level, but you also have the lockdown of migrant workers at the national level because they are trapped in Lebanon as a result of this crisis. And I will explain more here. Um, so as a result of these successive crises and what they are suffering from, uh, the majority of migrant uh, domestic workers in Lebanon now want to return to their home countries, but they cannot go back. Uh, because many of them have been dismissed from employment without a salary or without the plane ticket to go back home. And the plane ticket is usually the responsibility of the sponsor to provide. Many of them don't have valid papers and they cannot afford to pay the penalty fees that are imposed of them uh, because of their undocumented status. Many of them have their passports confiscated by employers and many of them cannot afford the PCR tests and the quarantine that is required. Um, uh, so the, uh, depending on the country, you are required to take a PCR before you travel and then sometimes upon arrival to their home country. And then in some countries they are allowed to, uh, they are uh, supposed to quarantine um, and pay out of pocket and they cannot afford to do that. So essentially, migrant domestic workers are trapped in Lebanon, and this is the national level lockdown, if you want. Um, what this translates to, unfortunately, is an increase in distress, acute distress um, at, on all levels. Um, and I'm borrowing this from a, a report by uh, NSF or Doctors Without Borders who started a medical helpline um, uh, at the beginning of the lockdown specifically for migrant workers. And they reported that migrant women are mostly like 94% of the people who sought this medical service were uh, women and 35% of them were homeless. 42% of them were survivors or uh, survivors of physical or sexual violence. 27% of them exhibited symptoms of psychotic disorder, which is quite a high percentage. 
41% contemplated suicide in the past six months, and more than half were diagnosed as actively suicidal by the MSF uh, psychologist. Um, this is quite shocking. Um, and uh, it's just getting uh, worse and worse, unfortunately. Uh, but what I really wanted to end on is um, just this parallel that they themselves are using is that the kafala itself is the lockdown. And by drawing this parallel, they can maybe uh, get employers to sympathize with their situation and to grant them more rights, including uh, freedom of movement, freedom of communication with family, with friends, freedom of having even relationships and not locking them um, inside uh, the homes. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much again, Zena, for this strong presentation. I think it's a bit overwhelming to hear your presentations, but I think we have to. Um, I mean, we only have to listen. You are within inside of these realities. Thank you very much. There was one question asking, where, where are these migrant workers from? The majority of the migrant workers are from Ethiopia, so we have over 400,000 Ethiopian workers, uh, but also from other African countries and Asian countries. We have a lot of people from the Philippines, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, um, also Sierra Leone, and Ghana, and a lot of uh, many other African countries. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I just at Medico, we followed a little bit the group of Sierra Leone women who were desperate to get to go back. And there was this absurd situation that whereas uh, all over the world, pe people are uh, kicked out and deported forcefully. Here were a group of women who wanted to go back and no one helped her to get back. So I think uh, also anti-racism movement tried to facilitate a process and we tried to link them up with Sierra Leonean NGOs to receive them, but it was a very desperate situation. Um, yeah, there's one more question. When the police arrests migrants workers, are they confined and detained by state officials and how, in which places and how is their situation there? Um, yes, that's a good question. Actually, with the start of COVID, that was one of the positive um, consequences is that the police stopped arresting undocumented workers just for the sake of being undocumented in order to reduce the overcrowding of prisons. Um, but yeah, usually they uh, arrest undocumented workers and they are then at risk of uh, deportation for having no papers. So they send them to jail unless they have enough money to pay the penalty fees that they owe the state for violating the residency permit. And there's one other question saying, what does kafala actually mean? Because the structure, how to employ migrant domestic labor is similar in Germany, in a way. Uh, kafala in Arabic means uh, guarantor or guaranteeship. So uh, initially it was supposed to have a positive spin on a not so positive system. Uh, it means that this uh, employer of the domestic worker is her guarantor, uh, as in guarantees her safety and uh, her rights and her employment in the country. Obviously in practice, um, the word sounds a bit absurd for us. Thank you. Now, I think it's also an interesting observation that a lot of there are some similarities to the German system, whereas the German system thinks it just is all very well organized, but I don't. But behind this discourse and this outer image, I think the, the social, economic and psychological realities in Germany are also looking different. And maybe I want to with this, I want to pass over to Neros und werde über zu unserer letzten ähm, Präsentation überleiten. 
äh, die Neros Duman äh, uns vorstellen wird und auch zur Realität in Deutschland, die eben hinter den Kulissen anders aussieht, als sie offiziell kommuniziert wird. Neros ist Aktivistin für Selbstorganisierung, Flucht, Empowerment und Antirassismus. Gemeinsam mit den Angehörigen der Ermordeten, den Verletzten und den anderen Aktiven kämpft sie in der Initiative 19. Februar um Erinnerung, Gerechtigkeit, Aufklärung und Konsequenzen der rassistischen Anschläge in Hanau. Sie ist Traumapädagogin und außerdem Referentin in der politischen Bildungsarbeit, Bewegungsarbeiterin in der Bewegungsstiftung, organisiert bei den Jugendlichen ohne Grenzen und Vorstandsmitglied von Pro Asyl. Neros, ähm, Stein, du bist dran. Vielen Dank. Ja, ich würde ähm, kurz was also dazu erzählen, was ist in Hanau dieses Jahr passiert und wie war unser Umgang damit, beziehungsweise was ähm, wir daraus aufgebaut haben. Am 19. Februar 2020 hat ein Rassist in der Kleinstadt Hanau neun Menschen ermordet, innerhalb von zwölf Minuten. Neun junge Menschen und er hat gezielt sich Orte ausgesucht, wo sich Menschen ähm, versammelt haben, Menschen unterhalten haben oder Zeit verbracht haben, die für ihn, für sein rassistisches Weltbild nicht zu dieser Gesellschaft gehören. Es ist in dieser kleinen Stadt passiert und ähm, für uns oder für viele in Deutschland lebende Menschen, die die Situation beobachten, was seit Jahren in diesem Land passiert oder seit Jahrzehnten. Und ähm, ähm, ist es nicht etwas, was eine totale Überraschung war, weil die gesellschaftliche und politische Hetze gegenüber Migration, gegenüber Geflüchtete ganz besonders seit 2015 und eine rassistische Partei im Parlament haben dazu auch geführt, dass eben Rassisten, Nazis an die Waffen greifen und das umsetzen, die andere im Parlament zur Sprache bringen, die die Taten umsetzen. Ne? Wir haben in Deutschland in der Gesellschaft in einem, in einen Diskurs seit vielen, vielen Jahren, die Migration als das Hauptproblem darstellt. Die Rechten werden in diesem Land und in, auch in ganz Europa stark und stärker und lauter, extrem laut. Und die Regierungen nehmen die Rechten mehr wahr als diejenigen, die von Gewalttaten betroffen sind, als diejenigen, die zur Zielscheibe gemacht werden, als diejenigen, die dann letztendlich auch ermordet werden. Und ähm, am 19. Februar ist es in unserer Stadt passiert. Und wir haben versucht natürlich zu gucken, wie können wir unterstützen. Wir sind viele Menschen, die aus, unter, die aus einer antirassistischen Bewegung kommen, die viele Jahre antirassistische Arbeit gemacht haben, die viel versucht haben, Netzwerke zu machen zwischen unterschiedlichen Bewegungen, Netzwerke zu machen, neue Formen von Aktionen zu finden, neue Koalitionen in Bewegung zu setzen, um eben gegen diese gesellschaftliche und politische Hetze gemeinsam zu agieren. Und wir haben uns hier zusammengesetzt und haben versucht zu unterstützen. Und für uns war es ziemlich ähm, schnell klar, dass wir einen Raum brauchen. Einen Raum der Solidarität, einen Raum, in dem man zusammenkommt, einen Raum, wo Menschen sich informieren können, wo man wütend sein kann, wo man trauern kann und wo man vor allem auch sich organisieren kann und Strategien entwickeln kann. Und diese Räume gab es eben nicht, weil nach so einem Anschlag ist klar, man bringt Menschen zusammen, die sehr unterschiedlich sind die vorher nicht viel zusammen gemacht haben oder die vorher nicht vielleicht an einem Tisch saßen. Ja? Deshalb war es uns total wichtig, einen sicheren Ort zu schaffen, 
wo alle eben zusammenkommen können, die betroffen sind, die darüber reden, die was machen wollen, die sich informieren wollen. Februar war eine Zeit, wo es noch keinen Lockdown gab. Am 19. Februar ist das passiert und im März, also ein paar Wochen später, vier Wochen später oder so, gab es schon eine harte Lockdown. Und es war für uns eine zweite Katastrophe in dieser Stadt. Eine zweite Katastrophe deshalb, weil man hat sehr genau gesehen, was staatliche Strukturen für ernst nehmen, was staatliche Strukturen fördern und was sie nicht machen. Bei Corona hat man überall versucht, neue Strukturen, alternative Strukturen aufzubauen, zu unterstützen und so weiter und so fort. Bei einem rassistischen Anschlag, die so eine krasse Dimension hat und so viele Menschen getroffen hat, hat man keinen Plan B entwickelt. Und daran sehen wir auch, was dem Staat, also was ist wichtig und was ist nicht wichtig. Wir haben in vier Wochen später diesen Raum geschaffen in der Stadt und dann sind Menschen zusammengekommen. Und in diesem Raum ging es um das, was du am Anfang gesagt hast, um Erinnerung, weil es darf kein Vergessen geben, um Aufklärung, was ist passiert, warum ist das passiert. Warum wurde das nicht verhindert, diese Attentat? Und auch um Gerechtigkeit, wie geht der Staat mit Angehörigen um, mit Betroffenen um? Was ist die Aufgabe des Staates und kommt der Staat dem nach? Nein, kennen wir schon seit Jahrzehnten, dass der Staat die Verantwortung nicht richtig übernimmt. Und um Thema Konsequenzen. Lernt Deutschland von rassistischen Anschlägen? Lernt dieses Land von rassistischen Anschlägen? Was sind die politischen Konsequenzen, politische und gesellschaftliche Konsequenzen? Unsere Erfahrung ist und war viele Jahre, es wird nicht gelernt, es wird vergessen, wenn es nicht die Menschen gibt, die Betroffenen, die selbst reden, die darauf aufmerksam machen und die fordern. Es wird vergessen. Und es gibt keine Gerechtigkeit, wenn es nicht gefordert wird, wenn es keine Selbstorganisierung gibt, wenn es keine solidarischen Strukturen gibt, dann passiert wenig. Weil in Deutschland sind wir ja daran gewohnt oder wir lieben es zu sagen, wir zurück zur Normalität. Es gibt eine Normalität der Mehrheitsgesellschaft, der weißen Mehrheitsgesellschaft. Eine Normalität, in der Rassismusdebatte Konsequenzen von solchen rassistischen Anschlägen nicht so einen großen Raum nehmen. Die Normalität der Mehrheitsgesellschaft, was nicht unsere Normalität ist. Wir haben nämlich auch eine andere Normalität und diese wird immer unterm Teppich gekehrt. Diese Normalität von strukturellen Rassismus, alltäglichen Rassismus, und der Umgang mit Anschlägen, mit Betroffenen und dass daraus nicht gelernt wird. Das ist die Normalität, die wir kennen, die nicht aber zu dem passt, was die Mehrheitsgesellschaft möchte und denkt. Um diese Normalität zu durchbrechen, braucht es Sichtbarkeit. Es braucht Sichtbarkeit und es braucht natürlich Selbstorganisierung und es braucht sichere Räume. Das ist mehrmals zu zu Sprache gekommen, sichere Räume schaffen. Sichere Räume schaffen, wo Menschen zusammenkommen. Wo man sprechen kann, organisieren kann, Strategien entwickeln kann. Und wir haben in der Lockdown-Zeit diesen Raum geschaffen. Wir haben es gemeinsam, diesen Raum geschaffen. Und den Raum haben wir nicht zugemacht. Und es war auch der einzige Ort in der gesamten Lockdown-Zeit, was für uns alle sozusagen erreichbar war und offen war. Der einzige Raum, in der wir uns bewegen konnten, der einzige Raum, in der wir uns begegnen konnten und der einzige Raum, in der wir uns damit auseinandersetzen seit über neun Monaten. Was ist passiert? Warum ist das passiert? Und wie machen wir auf die Forderungen aufmerksam? Wir haben am 22. August, sechs Monate danach, versucht, eine Demonstration zu machen die uns einen Tag vorher verboten wurde. 
und wir dann daraus eine Kundgebung gemacht haben mit Livestream. Dadurch haben wir mehr Leute erreicht, definitiv. Durch den Livestream haben wir mehr Leute erreicht. Aber wenn wir uns die Lage in Deutschland anschauen, wie viele Corona-Leugner und Rassisten und Nazis gemeinsam auf die Straße gehen und demonstrieren und eine Demonstration hier vor Ort die erste von allen gemeinsam getragene Demonstration verboten wird, daran sieht man auch, was ist, wem gibt man Raum und wem nicht. Und ähm, was wir gelernt haben oder was wir auch, glaube ich, schon lange wissen aus Erfahrungen an den europäischen Außengrenzen mit dem, mit dem also Sterben im Mittelmeer, Sterben lassen im Mittelmeer, auf den Routen, Fluchtrouten in Deutschland. Ähm, alles, was wir versuchen, sind Strukturen, transnationale Strukturen, solidarische Strukturen aufzubauen, in dem das, was wir fordern, auch möglich ist. Zum einen fordern wir die Politik, die Gesellschaft auf, die Strukturen zu verändern, die rassistischen Strukturen zu verändern. Zum anderen wissen wir aber auch, dass wir eben selber Strukturen aufbauen müssen, damit, damit das, was wir schon fordern, auch irgendwie zur Realität, die, wir das zur Realität machen. Sei es eine solidarische Unterbringung oder eine Beratung oder Zugänge schaffen. Zugänge für diejenigen, die eben keinen Zugang zu, keinen richtigen Zugang zu Bildungssystem haben oder zu Gesundheitssystem haben oder keinen richtigen Zugang zu sozialen Rechten haben. Das eine ist, gesamt, gesamtpolitisch sowas zu fordern. Das andere ist aber für jeden Person, jedes Individuum, diesen Zugang auch parallel möglich zu machen. Und ich glaube, dass ähm, in der Lockdown-Zeit, es gibt ja eine starke Traumatisierung von vielen verschiedenen Menschen. Und in dieser Phase, wo man weiß, es ist alles wird runtergefahren, es gibt kaum Orte, die unterstützt, also die staatlichen Strukturen, die ja irgendwie für alle da sein sollten, sind nicht mehr da, die ja eigentlich diese Verantwortung tragen, die aber alles runterfahren, dass das den Stresslevel natürlich höher macht. Der Stresslevel wird dadurch viel höher. Weil wir brauchen Aufklärung, wir brauchen soziale Gerechtigkeit, wir brauchen Erinnerung, wir brauchen Konsequenzen. Und wenn es nur um Corona geht und Lockdown und wir kämpfen wie verrückt, um das alles sichtbar zu machen, das ist eine, eine sehr intensive Situation. Eine Situation, in der es auch ein krasse Stresslevel gibt und wir uns natürlich auch damit auseinandersetzen müssen, wie, können, wie schaffen wir eine Balance, damit wir auch uns in unseren Räumen sicher fühlen, aber damit wir auch die Kraft haben, weiterzumachen, trotz unserer Differenzen, trotz unserer Widersprüche, die wir in diesen Kämpfen auch haben. Wir haben Differenzen, aber wir haben auch gleiche Ziele und da sind diese sichere Räume total wichtig und wir sind nicht in der Lage und nicht in der Position zu sagen, Lockdown und wir machen zu, das können wir nicht machen. Wir können nicht zumachen und wir können nicht ein, die einzigen Orte der Solidarität schließen. Wir müssen Umgang damit finden, wie die Orte neu, wie wir damit umgehen. Aber wir können nicht das machen, was der Staat eh schon macht. Diejenigen, die sowieso benachteiligt sind, nicht mehr zu unterstützen. So viel vielleicht dazu. Vielen Dank, Nerus. Ich glaube, das hat sehr anschaulich gezeigt, wie diese, was da los ist und wie die verschiedenen Krisen ineinander, ineinander gehen. Das habt ihr alle drei dargestellt. Es geht nicht nur, wir können nicht nur über Corona reden, wir können nicht nur über Lockdown reden, sondern diese, diese Corona-Krise, die, der Virus sozusagen setzt sich auf die politischen, sozialen, ökonomischen 
psychosozialen Verhältnisse hinauf, die schon existieren und verschärft sie, vertieft sie, macht es immer deutlicher, welche Leben zählen und welche nicht. Eine Hierarchisierung der Leben und was ist eigentlich und umgekehrt, was es bedeutet, so etwas wie auch solidarische, kollektive Räume zu haben und nicht individuell isoliert zu sein. Sichere Orte, wie du sagst, und auch Sichtbarkeit. Ich wollte euch allen dreien wirklich danken, dass ihr uns diese Sichtbarkeit hier gegeben habt, weil ich glaube, also in, jedenfalls in der deutschen Öffentlichkeit wird sehr ganz wenig über diese Realitäten gesprochen und ganz viel über, über die Realität von Mittelschichts Homeoffice Leute, die sich langweilen und nicht mehr wissen, wie sie die Langeweile aushalten. Ich frage mich gerade, ob wir irgendwie fünf Minuten Pause brauchen, um mit Diskussion zu gehen. Wie geht es euch dreien? Kann ich euch mal fragen? Ich finde, wir können weitermachen. Ja? It's okay, ja, we, can, we can continue? Ja. Ähm, es gibt ähm, noch ein paar Fragen, die hinterher kamen, auch zu Johanna und zu den anderen Präsentationen. Vielleicht fange ich an, dass ich die ähm, erstmal reingebe. Ähm, eine Frage war danach, Johanna, könntest du, could you name a source where you challenge the Western definition of trauma? There's a publication, I'm not sure if it's published yet, but that we were part of. It's, it was entitled, it's an African feminist kind of collective that put this together the last 10 years called Transformative feminist approaches to trauma. Um, I'm not sure if it's been published yet. Um, so that's where a whole lot of African women have put together their ideas through various workshops and get together over quite a long period of time. Um, but I think just in summary, um, what, what I call the Western concept of trauma, is very much confined to to the psychological and and what this group of African women um, have sort of all agreed on is that we cannot just we cannot separate the psychology of trauma from people's livelihoods from their daily experience from daily the daily stress. I mean, I always talk in our context about um, we often get don't get to what is theoretically defined as trauma which would have been the the slaughter of my family in the Congo in the Kivus um, because actually the person I'm sitting with is hungry the children are crying they're not at school you know um, the daily stress of survival is a trauma in itself and and so I think that we need to if we're going to we need to look at trauma in a context of livelihood, of rights, of justice, of gender equality. Um, yeah, it's kind of part of a human rights culture. Um, and so that's just in brief, I think, what, uh, what we've been looking at. And also, I think what Ross said about the, the safe spaces, the importance of safe spaces that people don't have in their homes or in their families. Um, I think is is really really critical creating safe spaces for people um, to to at the very least gather the courage to deal with the next daily stressor. Anything you want to add, Nero Susena, also with regard to this question about trauma and about safe spaces? Yeah, I. Um... I just have to share a reflection that was made by a psychiatrist who was working uh, in Lebanon in 2014 in response to the refugee crisis of uh, Syrian refugees coming to Lebanon. And uh, she was asked to provide psychosocial support. And uh, she was reflecting on how limited um, 
the tools are of uh, psychology and psychiatry in the face of such um, uh, structural, political and economic um, problems and uh, how we really need to rethink the way we approach uh, mental health and uh, repoliticize our practices as psychologists and as psychiatrists uh, to expand our uh, toolkit and uh, to look at more, uh, in a sense, uh, political activism that would respond to um, the livelihood needs and uh, rights of uh, these populations. And it's not just about a therapy session and it's not just about uh, giving a pill here and a pill there. And it's not just about creating this uh, rapport between uh, a safe uh, therapist and uh, the patient. Uh, it's also about attending to the most basic needs first. Thank you. Neros? Ja, was ich ähm, gerne auch zu Trauma sagen wollen würde, ist, als wir in Nordsyrien unterwegs waren, in Rojava, mit einer Gruppe von Traumapädagogen, ging es genau um die Frage, wie lässt sich das die Traumakonzepte hier auf eine Region, die einen Krieg erlebt hat, die eigentlich immer noch mittendrin steckt, die im Aufbauprozess ist, wie lässt sich das übertragen? Und ähm, da waren wir uns alle darin einig, Traumakonzepte aus einem deutschen, deutschsprachigen Raum, europäischen Raum, lässt sich natürlich nicht auf eine Region ähm, wie Rojava eins zu eins übersetzen. Und darin gibt es aber diese mh, Prozesse, ähm, was kann man daraus lernen und was gibt es hier, also was kann man gegenseitig lernen von Prozessen der Traumaverarbeitung. Und was ich aus my, meinem kurdischen Hintergrund, sage ich mal, kenne, ist die kollektiven Traumaverarbeitungsprozesse finden hier zum Beispiel ähm, nicht so viel Raum. Also ich meine nicht mit hier in unserem Raum, sondern ich meine grundsätzlich im europäischen Raum ist ja so mehr diese individuelle Verarbeitung der, des Traumas oder so. Aber zu, zu sehen, dass kollektive Prozesse auch eine sehr empowernde, ähm, was Empowerndes für jedes Individuum in sich hat, findet nicht so viel Raum. Und das ist etwas, was ich total wichtig finde zu betonen. Ähm, Traumaverarbeitung oder wie, Stabilisierung heißt ja auch zum Beispiel, findet auch darin, dass man sich organisiert, dass man sich Gehör verschafft und dass man gehört wird mit dem, was man vertritt und fordert. Das sind auch Prozesse der, wie soll ich sagen, Stabilisierung, Heilung, das ist nicht in einer Therapie, aber das ist in einem Prozess der Organisierung drin. Und das sind kollektive Prozesse. Und diese kollektive Prozesse an sich sind einfach so wichtig, vor allem wenn es so viele Menschen betroffen sind, dass wir mehr verstehen. Kollektive Prozesse braucht es auch hier. Danke, Neuros. Danke. Ähm ich wollte gerade schnell noch eine Frage auch an dich hier anschließen, die im Chat kam. Mit welcher Begründung denn die Demonstration abgesagt wurde, die ihr geplant hattet am 22. August? Corona. Also ähm, die Begründung war, dass äh, die Zahlen ähm, gestiegen sind und ähm, dadurch keine Demonstration in dieser Stadt stattfinden kann. Und äh, wir versuchen dann so schnell wie möglich eben eine Alternative, Alternative aufzubauen. Nämlich, das wird trotzdem gemacht und das war auch ein gemeinsamer Prozess. Es wird gemacht, es, diese Bühne wird da sein. Die Menschen, die sprechen wollen, werden sprechen und man schafft eine andere Struktur, damit andere im ganzen Land auch zuhören können. Und das haben wir geschafft. Ja, ich weiß, ihr habt, das war in einer irrsinnigen Zeit, habt ihr trotzdem irgendwie auch digital die ganze Veranstaltung umgesetzt. Und ich glaube, trotzdem zwei, drei Wochen später gab es eine riesige äh, Querdenker-Demo, die erlaubt wurde. Ne? 
Also eine Woche später. Ja. Ich will jetzt an meine Kollegin Julia geben. Die hat noch mal Fragen und auch eine eigene Frage, die sie vielleicht an die Referentinnen stellen kann. Julia. Okay, uh, hello again from backstage. Um, we or I had a very, very big question because, uh, yeah, as we are always longing for the creation of a political subject, a at best transnational political subject, this morning we were already thinking about whether we could become a common post corona, post feminist cyborg, and we were not at all satisfied by, by this idea because it felt so non-physical and non-real. Um, and you, Nervous and Joanna, you focus especially on, on, this, on safe spaces. Um, Joanna, you said that uh, we can never replace physical presence by digital presence. And I was wondering whether there have been nevertheless any moments of digital presence or digital exchange that was worth mentioning maybe a bit be beyond this we see you on zoom or because everyone is already talking about the zoom fatigue so yeah is there any moments of are there any moments of hope for a transnational exchange digitally yeah i mean i was talking about about our interactions with with people who who are extremely vulnerable extremely traumatized um who have no private spaces in their in their homes, um, who have no access to proper phones, never mind WhatsApp. Um, that you know, you you could not do more than a check in um, with our clients. I think with colleagues and with the broader sector, we we have had really good conversations and dialogue, and actually better attendance than we normally would have in face-to-face -face interaction. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm old fashioned. I'm struggle with it. I still struggle with um, the two dimensional aspect of it. Um, but I think, yeah, it should be possible. Um, but but for, for vulnerable people and for people that that really need that place of belonging and and solidarity and and care and and listening to their stories um the digital space just doesn't do it does anyone else want to comment or add on that how do you deal with the digital space in your work? Um, <laughs> ich würde ähm, dazu sagen, jetzt unabhängig von Thema Trauma, sondern grundsätzlich zum Thema Beziehungen und gemeinsame, gemeinsame Kämpfe, gemeinsame Räume. Ähm, ich glaube, es ist total wichtig, nicht zu sagen, ähm, dadurch, dass das meiste im Moment online geht, es ist verloren. Ähm, ich glaube, es ist trotzdem, also es ist wichtig, natürlich kann das nicht so sein, wie wenn wir einen Raum teilen. Das funktioniert auf gar keinen Fall online. Aber den Raum, der da existiert, finde ich, für die Kämpfe, die wir führen, vor allem jetzt unabhängig von dem, was wir vor Ort machen, weil wir haben hier einen Raum, in dem wir uns sehen und begegnen und ähm, auch umarmen und so, das ist was anderes. Ich finde, wir sind in einer Phase, wo wir uns darüber Gedanken machen müssen. Diese digitale Räume, die sind da. Das schafft trotzdem eine Art von, das schafft trotzdem Verbindung, Austausch. Und man darf die Hoffnung nicht verlieren, sondern die Frage stellen, wie stellen wir uns neu auf, aufgrund dieser extremen Situation, die uns eben ganz viel wegnimmt, ganz viel soziale Räume, die wir geteilt haben, die für das, was wir machen, für unsere politische soziale Kämpfe, sehr wichtig sind. Da fehlt ja was Großes, aber wie nutzen wir das, wie nutzen wir das aus? Wie stellen wir uns neu auf? Was sind unsere Strategien darin? Dafür muss man das, glaube ich, dafür muss man sich immer wieder die Frage stellen, was wir müssen, was Neues vielleicht aufbauen und finden, 
Und damit müssen wir uns beschäftigen, nicht mit der Frage, ähm, was nimmt das alles weg? Es ist auch wichtig, aber wir müssen uns, glaube ich, wir müssen eine andere Art von Aufstellung uns überlegen, von, von wie geht es weiter mit dem, was wir ja machen. Versteht ihr, was ich meine? Also es ist noch mal, es, es öffnet einfach nochmal neue Diskussionen, weil es ist eine andere Dimension. Voll, danke, das war super klar. Ich wollte nochmal die Sena fragen. Um, maybe let me ask in English directly. I mean, how, how do you deal with that kind of the balance that you, you also, you work with collective spaces, you have your centers, you, you bring people together, you organize together and at the same time you want to be caring and not expose people unnecessary to the virus. But I guess you have to balance the different needs. You're working with people who are literally on the streets, kicked out from home, starving, living in the streets. And then how, what's the virus? How do you, in practical terms, how do you manage it to have to continue collective work, solidarity work, and still be caring around the virus issue? It's been quite challenging, to be honest. Um, I'll tell you just uh, one anecdote. Uh, when we tried to first switch to online classes um, at the beginning of the lockdown, just to test it out, and we had the migrant women waiting for their uh, teacher, and the teacher was trying to tell them, you know, just press the microphone for the mute button. And all of them went up trying to search for an actual microphone. <laughs> like one second, I'll find the microphone to talk. So this kind of um, miscommunication uh, that happened that was uh, quite funny, but just shows the limitation of, um, you know, uh, introducing this new medium to uh, to people who don't have necessarily this experience and are not necessarily interested in building up uh, this experience of uh, having this online exchange. Uh, but it was still very important. Although we stopped the online, uh, uh, we stopped the online classes because they failed massively. But uh, we stopped also the physical uh, classes. It was still important to continue advocacy work. And I have to say that in terms of advocacy, of course, we had limited focus groups. So instead of uh, consulting a room full of 40 migrant workers from the same nationality about what they need, um, it was limited to, uh, we divided them into several smaller groups uh, to be able to consult them, take their opinion and engage them in the advocacy process. However, what it did open up, uh, what was very interesting is that it opened up our imagination in terms of connecting with their home countries and their countries of origin and exploring the possibilities of reaching out to activists there instead of going physically and organizing a whole event around this and trying to um, get to them through international partners. It was a simple online invitation Uh, that gathered a lot of uh, unusual suspects in the same room all of a sudden, uh, people from different home countries. And that includes, for example, uh, Sierra Leone that you mentioned earlier. Uh, we just found an organization uh, working with the domestic worker returnees. We found it online. We shot her an email and uh, now she is one of our most trusted partners there um, because of this online communication that became um, the norm for us that maybe wouldn't have been uh, possible. I don't know why. I mean, it was always possible, but I think in terms of imagination and creativity, we are always stuck in what we know and uh, the status quo and how we do things all the time. So it opened up these possibilities. Um, which was very helpful for it. Yeah, maybe uh, here it also, there's one question from one listener, which uh, adds to this, uh, saying that, isn't it that many transnational families every day's reality is to create a digital space of closure, exchange, safety, happiness, and mourning with, with their families at home? So maybe we should also learn from that also for activism. I mean, there are ma many transnational families around the world, Skype families, Skype fathers, Skype mothers, etc. Yeah, 
I think that's an interesting question. Who wants to respond? Ich ähm, finde es total spannend, dass du diesen Punkt aufgemacht hast, weil Sena vorhin auch gesagt hat, es ist, also du hast es ja damit aufgemacht, also aus der Geschichte der Migration heraus oder Menschen, die migriert sind, die geflüchtet sind, war ja in den letzten Jahren diese Technik ja extrem wichtig. Also zum einen, um Kontakt ähm, zu halten zu der Familie, die in vielen Fällen auch nicht nur in einem Land war, sondern in verschiedenen Ländern verteilt. Und es ist total wichtig, wenn man beobachtet, wie gerade in den letzten Jahren die Verbindungen entstanden sind, was migrantische Communities nutzen. Ne? Also ich sage mal aus meiner Familie, wie gerade irgendwie aus verschiedenen Ländern Menschen miteinander in Verbindung sind und das nutzen für das ähm, und für den Austausch auch nutzen. Ne? Und es war etwas, was ja viel da war, was man aber auch, was nicht so wirklich im Vordergrund war, weil man, glaube ich, sich sehr auf das fokussiert hat, was vor Ort passiert oder was erreichbar ist das physisch auch erreichbar ist. Ne? Und ähm, wir haben schon, finde ich, die letzten Jahre, wo wir versucht haben, ganz viel transnationale Verbindungen zu schaffen, ja, also von Nordafrika bis, bis irgendwie Europa, Türkei und so weiter, wo es versucht wurde, so ganz viele transnationale Verbindungen zu schaffen, es hatten wir oder es ist, hat uns dazu bewegt, eben auch zu versuchen, Technik neu auszuprobieren. Also ich sage mal nur ein Beispiel, das Alarmphone, Watch the Mad Alarmphone, ja. Das Alarmphone, das ist eine Notrufnummer für Menschen in Seenot. Und 2014 haben wir uns damit beschäftigt. Und als wir damit beschäftigt waren, ich habe WhatsApp benutzt, ja. Meine Freunde, die diese Idee mitentwickelt haben, die hatten kein WhatsApp, die haben sich damit nicht beschäftigt. So. Und das war eine Zeit, wo wir diese Notrufnummer in ja, aufgebaut haben und wie sich migrantische Communities auch, also wie sich das verbreitet hat, wie Technik wichtig wurde, ähm, wenn man über Migration redet und über Flucht, was da Technik für eine verbindende und auch eine, ja, lebensrettende Rolle spielt. Und auch nochmal äh, transnational, äh, transnational andere Verbindungen schafft. Das, was wir nicht hatten, ich meine, die Verbindung, die es jetzt gibt, Netzwerke, von Nordafrika bis Europa bis in die Türkei, Mensch, Gruppen, Aktivisten, Menschen, die politisch aktiv sind, die miteinander eine andere Verbindung haben, die ja auch nur ähm, so online möglich war. Danke. Ich, vielleicht kann ich da auch ergänzen, also dass ich glaube auch jetzt zum Beispiel bei uns bei Medico, dass sich da einiges verschoben hat und auch neue Möglichkeiten entstanden sind. Vielleicht selbst so ein Workshop wie diesen. Ja? Äh, wären wir Im physischen Raum hätten wir unter Umständen überhaupt nicht daran gedacht, euch drei einzuladen oder hätten gedacht, das ist zu kompliziert oder es passt nicht zusammen oder wir hätten das physisch uns getrennter vorgestellt. Und äh, im digitalen Raum wurde es plötzlich klar, Natürlich sprecht ihr aus völlig anderen Kontexten, Situationen, aber es gibt durchaus viele verbindende Punkte, über die wir reden können und die wir sichtbar machen können und die, die, wo wir uns vernetzen können. Und so haben wir neulich auch einen Austausch über, mit Leuten aus acht Ländern, über vier, mit vier Sprachen und vier Zeitzonen hinweg über das Thema, das Joanna angesprochen hat von Staff Care, wie gehen eigentlich die, wie geht eigentlich ihr Leute in solchen Initiativen mit dieser Belastung, mit diesem Druck, mit diesem Stress um, der Corona on top auf all die anderen Probleme mit sich gebracht hat, wie kann man sich selbst schützen, wie ohne sozusagen sehenden Auges auch in die Selbstzerstörung zu gehen und welche Art von auch kollektiven solidarischen Netzen könnte, könnte es geben. Also ich höre, dass es gibt sozusagen vor Ort müssen, müssen physische Räume, physische Orte äh, da sein, wo Leute sich auch physisch treffen können als sicheren Ort. Aber es kann für die Advocacy-Arbeit und für den Austausch durchaus digitale Räume geben. Ich ähm, weiß nicht, wer von euch im Panel noch was dazu sagen will oder auch vom Publikum. Ich weiß, dass diese dass für das Publikum es sehr undankbar ist, jetzt nur sozusagen per Chat und per kleinen 
Message sich zu beteiligen und nicht einfach aufzustehen und eine Frage zu stellen. Aber ich will euch trotzdem alle einladen, da an der Diskussion euch zu beteiligen. Ähm, Jule, möchtest du einfach die Fragen vorstellen, die inzwischen gekommen sind und äh, hier reinbringen? Okay, also hallo <lacht> schon wieder. Ähm, genau, eine Frage war noch, ähm, ob nicht eigentlich die Gefahr von technischer Überwachung äh, mit den ganzen quasi modernen auch Überwachungsfunktionen, ob die nicht eigentlich ähm, vor allen Dingen wieder repressiven staatlichen Akteuren äh, in die Hände spielt, weil quasi alle die aktivistische Community sich eben in diesem digitalen und überwachbaren Raum begegnen muss. Ähm, genau, und beeinflusst das eigentlich eure Arbeit jetzt gerade? I'm, I'm talking about the people I work with, um, the people from the from the DRC, and especially people from the the Kivus, and then people from Rwanda. Or um, people do have WhatsApp, and they do communicate with families around WhatsApp. But the data for that WhatsApp is very, very carefully managed. Um, and and especially, I mean, the Rwandans at the moment are are really terrified of, of that kind of vigilance by the state. Um, one, of, one of my, my clients um, shared a picture of her having a, um, a baby shower, which was organized by a woman, some of whom belonged to the Rwanda National Council, a uh, National Congress. Um, in exile and and you know she is now terrified because that picture has gone round and she is now perceived as belonging to to the to the rnc and um is being called by the embassy we don't know for what you know so i think it can cause terror um the other thing is of course that um the digital media also give rise to especially what's up to a prol proliferation of fake news which then um, reactivates trauma. So we often have, especially in the Congolese community, um, WhatsApp messages during the full cycle of um, that children in the school were killed and don't send your children to school anymore on such and such a date, they're gonna come and kill us. Um, and, and there's no evidence of that. And on the other hand, um, xenophobic South African organizations or groupings also use um, WhatsApp, to, especially WhatsApp, to, to send out threats on such and such a date. We are going to um, get all the foreign national kids out of the schools by force or, on, or by such and such a date. You must be out of the country. We're coming to kill you. So all of that kind of creates enormous upheaval and trauma. Um, in the community. So I think there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of risk involved. Anyone else who wants to add on that? Ja, ich glaube, wenn man Technik benutzt, dann ist die Frage der uh, es schwingt ja immer mit dabei. Es ist aber immer die Frage, wo wird das umgesetzt? Wofür brauchen wir das? Und es ist immer die Frage des Abwägens. Also wir brauchen diese Mittel, um bestimmte Sachen machen zu können, weil sich davon komplett fernzuhalten, ist ja auch eine Art von, diese Medien nicht zu nutzen, ist auch eine Art von Privileg, wenn man eine andere Möglichkeit hat. Also entweder man ist darauf angewiesen, weil man überhaupt keine andere Möglichkeit hat, oder man hat andere Möglichkeiten, die sicherer sind oder man kann sich frei bewegen. Es gibt diese Bewegungsfreiheit, was keine, kaum Grenzen kennt. Und das, das ist auch eine Frage, die da mit drin ist. Ne? Also wer hat welche Möglichkeiten und ähm, wer benutzt was? Und natürlich ist es bei uns, wenn ich von unseren Bewegungen oder von unseren Strukturen ausgehe, dann war das auch immer die Frage in den letzten Jahren, ähm, sichere Wege zu finden, zu kommunizieren in bestimmten Sachen. Ne? Also das ist ja klar, dass man sich damit auch irgendwie auseinandersetzen muss. 
Und in bestimmten Sachen ist es dann halt irgendwie zweitrangig, was man da benutzt und was man nicht benutzt. Es ist halt zweitrangig, weil es ist, wie gesagt, auch nochmal die Frage des Zugangs und das, was man umsetzen möchte und was nur durch diese Art von Kommunikation vielleicht machbar ist. Es ist immer die Frage auch der Mobilität und der Bewegenheit. Danke. Jule, gibt es noch weitere Fragen? Ne? Ähm, gerade könnten die ZuschauerInnen noch mal gerne in die Tasten hauen, denn gerade gibt es äh, erstmal keine weiteren Fragen. Aber ähm, ich habe eigentlich noch eine, beziehungsweise erstmal auch eine Anmerkung. Danke für eure Antworten auf meine Frage. Ist ja auch wieder ein Kampf um dann. Safe Spaces, eben auch Digital Safe Spaces. Ähm, ich würde gerne noch mal Drana und Sena fragen, vielleicht jetzt auch Deutschland spezifisch mehr oder weniger, aber ähm, im Zuge des Corona-Ausbruchs hat es ja hier ähm, eine vermehrte, eine was hat schon gesagt, öffentliches Zeigen von Rechten und vor allen Dingen auch von Verschwörungstheorien im Zusammenhang äh, mit dem Virus stattgefunden. Das, äh, aus den USA äh, schreibt ja auch die QAnon-Bewegung rüber. Wie sieht es denn in euren Kontexten aus? Hat es da auch sowas gegeben? Wie geht ihr damit um? Danke. Um, we haven't had an organized um, sort of right-wing movement um, of protest. Um, but I think what, what's happening in terms of The COVID protocols, our, our rates are relatively low at the moment, although they're going up again and we're expecting them to go up again after Christmas because people are going into the rural areas for, for the holidays. Um, I think, I mean, I've just been at this funeral um, in the township and yeah, I mean, with the men, it's definitely an act of defiance. We are not going to be told what to do but it's not organized. Um, even during the hard lockdown, um, I was relatively mobile because I had a very ill partner and could move around to get to medical services. Um, and the people on the street were the men, um, which was quite interesting. And the women were, and I live in a very poor area, um, the women were inside, the men were, were um, out and not masking and not taking precautions. Um, so I think there are these individual acts of defiance, um, but not um, not organized. Mm, yeah, Zaina, would you like to comment, uh, to, sorry, to comment on that question? And there's another question that goes maybe hand in hand with it from uh, Stefan Milich to you. Um, how you describe the public discourse on, on racism in Lebanon and oh, in Germany and I guess oh, everywhere racism and um, conspiracy theories are going hand in hand. Go ahead, the first years. We actually have the interesting case where this is not, uh, they don't go hand in hand, I would say. Um, and to To understand this, I'll give you a bit of context. So um, in October 17, 2019, a big um, uh, popular uprising uh, uh, emerged in Lebanon. So we had a huge revolution across the entire country where people were really expressing their disapproval uh, of the state and their distrust in the state and its uh, corruption and its sectarianism um, among a million other things. Um, and so uh, the unfortunate thing is that um, obviously the, the, the state responded with a brute force and uh, repressed this uh, revolution, but it kept uh, coming up and, you know, it stayed alive quite uh, for quite a long time with massive numbers of uh, people on the street every day, every day. Um, continued on until uh, January, where it was very brutally uh, repressed with uh, very heavy violence and there were a lot of uh, casualties. And then it sort of started to die down. Um, and I say this because then there was the Corona crisis, uh, almost you know, overlapping with this. And um, the public discourse was that uh, 
the, our government is creating this corona crisis in order to further repress this revolution and to prevent us from going in the, into the streets and to scare us from uh, you know, uh, opposing the state uh, and in such huge numbers. Um, so this kind of discourse really persisted for a while and still even among um, among uh, my feminist circles, unfortunately, there's this discourse that um, the state exaggerates the number of cases of corona in order to keep us at home and to prevent us from uh, revolting against it. And in this sense, it's very different from the other conspiracy theories where it goes hand in hand with the racism. It's actually the opposite. It's, um, uh, uh, yeah, the way, uh, you, in a sense, the, the, the racist state is using corona in, in their eyes or in the eyes of the population as a tool um, to repress um, the anti-racist and the feminists and uh, the anti-corruption uh, people. Um, the way racism manifests, um, in addition to everything that I've already mentioned, um, there are many uh, layers and many hierarchies of uh, nationalities and ethnicities and even uh, religious sects in Lebanon. Um, we have many racist narratives uh, that uh, date uh, from a very long time ago. For example, Lebanese people are racist against uh, uh, Palestinian pe people, and uh, this started due to the involvement of the Palestinian people in the uh, civil war back in 1975, um, and it persisted until today, uh, where we st still see these incidents of racism uh, between Palestinians, uh, between Lebanese and Palestinians. Um, in a very similar way, uh, uh, the Syrian refugees are associated with the military, the Syrian military occupation of Lebanon uh, that also uh, was in very recent history and lasted up until 2005, which is really very recent. And so when, when the Syrian revolution erupted and when it uh, continued into a civil war and a huge uh, influx of Syrian refugees crossed into Lebanon, um, so uh, we got to a point where 25% of the residents of Lebanon were Syrians. This racism really came to the surface because of this association, first of all, between um, Syrians and this military occupation that stays in our memory still very vividly, but also the similarity between um, uh, Syrians now uh, wanting to settle into camps and the uh, um, the longevity of, or the, yeah, the longevity of the the or the permanence of the Palestinian refugee camps um, that were set in Lebanon uh, with the hopes that Palestinians would go back to their country, and obviously because of the Israeli occupation, this has never happened, and this uh, rejection of this permanence and this fear of this permanence has also translated um, against the Syrian population. Now, when it comes to um, other, you know, migrant workers, it's really, um, the way we read it is that um, the state sees the kafala system as a very uh, convenient way to uh, let go of its responsibility of providing care work um, and uh, social security and health care for the population. We have very limited public services, almost non-existent. And domestic workers kind of fill this gap of care work uh, for very cheap. So it's really undervalued work for very cheap. Uh, any Lebanese household can uh, buy this uh, care work and it deflects this uh, responsibility from the responsibility of the state to provide this care work. And in the sense, in a sense, this kind of um, construction of this kafala system and this economic system and this exploitation of uh, migrant domestic workers in, the, in that way really serves the state. And on top of it, um, there came the racist uh, narrative and the racist justification and the hierarchization of um, the nationalities. I don't know if it, if it made a lot of sense, but what I mean to say is that the, the economic incentive sort of preceded the racism itself in that case. Thank 
thank you very much. Uh, one quest, uh, question was regarding the Kafala system, whether you could maybe in two sentences explain its particularities. Um, yeah, so the Kafala system is a way of uh, organizing uh, migrant labor in Lebanon. So it's a collection of laws and policies written and unwritten. Uh, a lot of it is customary uh, policy, but it's a way of uh, regulating the immigration process and the, the labor process of all migrant workers. The particularity of it is really tying two individuals to each other and putting one individual at the mercy of another uh, in terms of uh, the right to work and in terms of the right to stay, uh, to have a legal stay in the country. And the fact that because it happens in households and because it happens behind closed doors, there is no state oversight, which uh, reinforces this uh, exploitation uh, with, uh, without any accountability. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, never, sorry. Zu deiner Frage von vorher. Um, sorry. Was Querdenker und was die Rechten und alle, die auf die Straße gehen und in Deutschland, was das ausgerüstet hat, ich würde dazu nur zwei Sätze sagen wollen. Was um, hier wieder passiert ist, einfach eine eine total krasse Bewegung, die ja auch nicht neu ist in Deutschland. In den letzten Jahren gibt es das immer wieder. Ähm, die Rechten und die besorgten Bürger, nennt man die, ähm, gehen auf die Straße um haben ein Feindbild. Und Feindbild in den letzten Jahren waren immer die Flüchtlinge und Migration und so weiter. Und es ist jetzt in den letzten Wochen, Monaten eine sehr krasse Gefahr. Also es sind Tausende Menschen, die überall auf die Straße gehen, mit Nazis Hand in Hand und machen eine total krasse ähm, Antisem also eine, es sind total krasse Antisemiten, es, die haben eine krasse Rassismus, die sie auf die Straße tragen ähm, und Verschwörungstheorien gegenüber Jüdinnen und Juden und gegenüber Migranten und das ist, der Staat ist irgendwie offensichtlich nicht fähig, diese Menschen, die sich da versammeln, als Gefahr, als eine wirkliche Gefahr zu erkennen. Diese Gefahr, also wir müssen, das ist das, was ich vorhin versucht habe zu erklären, wir müssen, der Staat muss es verstehen, die Politik und die Gesellschaft muss es verstehen, dass diese Massen, die auf die Straße gehen und gegenüber Jüdinnen und Juden und gegenüber Migranten und andere Minderheiten dann ähm, hetzen, dass es genau ein Teil dessen ist, was die Nazis und Rassisten dazu bringt, zu morden in diesem Land. Und das ist das, was erkannt werden muss. Da, kommt, da ist eine Gefahr. Die war nie weg, aber die ist jetzt wieder anders deutlich auf der Straße. Danke, Neros. Und ich glaube... Ähm uh, maybe I switch to English again. It's easier. I, I can. I think this issue of also instrumentalizing the crisis for whatever political purpose, especially for the right, yeah, right wing conspiracy theories. It's 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 a huge danger everywhere. And there's a it's a kind of a thin line between like defending our collective spaces against corona restrictions you know and and um and those who just uh, kind of use the corona as an as an excuse to mobilize for their own purposes and and maybe it's also a way i would call it maybe a caring solidarity yes we need real collective physical spaces but one can meet in a caring way with more distance and smaller groups and whatever we, we, there are all these creative things. I, I, in order to, to close, I would just like to give uh, the three of you one question for the closing round. I mean, 
Um, we are here also listeners in, um, and, and I'm very glad that what you were talking about and showing to us, but how can we contribute as listeners, as organizations like Medico, as a society for psychoanalytical social psychology, how can we contribute that the reality you were talking about and especially the, the human beings, the individuals who are living under horror, horrific uh, um, conditions, that they become more visible, that they are spoken about, that they are not forgotten, that there is, is uh, constantly in a, in a, in a, yeah, in a constantly reminded of this is the real issues and not, as I say, maybe middle class complaints about home office um, uh, boredom. And I don't know, what other, are there any other wishes or demands or, or hopes you want to express towards us and the public who is listening in terms of that task of visibility and all? Who wants to start and give a final round? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um. Ich glaube, wir sprechen alle drei aus sehr, sehr unterschiedlichen Positionen und Perspektiven und da sind Ähnlichkeiten, aber auch große Differenzen natürlich, was möglich ist und was nicht. Ich kann nur für hier sagen, um, dass ich finde, die Sichtbarkeit, ähm, Aufmerksamkeit und Veränderungen ähm, dadurch auch sehr stark werden, dass existierende Strukturen, die sich schon jahrzehntelang dafür einsetzen, ähm, sich auch mehr öffnen müssen und mehr Räume schaffen müssen für diejenigen, die eben betroffen sind. Dass diejenigen, ähm, für die wir sozusagen kämpfen, ähm, mehr im Mittelpunkt stehen und wir Strukturen, wir ähm, Ressourcen zur Verfügung stellen, weil der Zugang zu Ressourcen ist ja total entscheidend, wenn wir über all diese Gruppen sprechen, worüber wir heute gesprochen haben. Der Zugang zu Ressourcen ist einfach ganz anders als die von einer NGO oder von einer aktivistischen Gruppe, die sich zusammengefunden ähm, haben, um gemeinsam zu kämpfen. Deshalb geht es mir ähm, persönlich immer darum, zu gucken, die Verbindungen schaffen, Räume zu schaffen, um diejenigen, die betroffen sind, auch zu empowern ähm, und die Ressourcen dafür zu, zu ver zur Verfügung zu stellen. Das ist für mich ein sehr entscheidender Punkt, wenn wir über Empowerment und über Antirassismus sprechen und über ja, Zugang zu sozialen und politischen Rechten. Dankeschön. It's actually very similar for us. Um, I would say that it also echoes something that Johan said uh, in the beginning about uh, us always trying to resist uh, becoming a, humanita a humanitarian aid organization. I completely identify with that. Um, this was not why our organization was created and we would very much like to go back to our initial purpose. And unfortunately, um, these uh, crises uh, have uh, really um, shifted our focus into things that are uh, more basic needs because you cannot do your initial work without attending to people's basic, very basic needs, including food and shelter and water and, and, and. Um, so for me, I think for any international organization or any organization with resources and power, um, it's very important to watch out for the smaller groups um, and preventing their conversion from uh, community groups focused mostly on rights advocacy uh, into um, NGO sort of work and humanitarian aid sort of work. Because this is not what we want to do, and this is not the space that we aim to occupy, and this is not our political agenda, and we have an agenda that is super important and that's being eaten away uh, because of these basic needs. So if, if other organizations could expand you know, their humanitarian aid to include the most vulnerable, um, then we can go back to doing our initial and fulfilling our initial uh, mission. That's very clear. 
Joanna. Yeah, thank you, Joanna. I think you said it beautifully. Um, I mean, we are a grassroots organization. We're not an advocacy. I mean, we're not, our core purpose is, is um, bringing people together, creating safe spaces, um, facilitating solidarity and healing. Um, and we, I mean, we work with advocacy organizations. We, we take information. We, we have a lot of information <laughs> that we get from the kind of the privacy and the confidentiality of, of the counseling space um, that can be taken into advocacy strategies. Um, but I think for us, it's, we, we're not working in the, in the political space. And I think, so for us, it's important that um, the voices that we hear every day and that play themselves out in our heads all the time um, are heard in bigger spaces and that they are combined with the voices. I think what COVID has done, it's, it's, it's put all these voices together. Everywhere people are hungry, everywhere people are homeless, everywhere people have lost their jobs, everywhere NGOs are struggling. Um, that somehow we need to find a co collective voice and, and that um, partner organizations try to facilitate that, that have that political or um, clout. We don't have political clout in South Africa either. Um, we, we can't get funding from, from the South African government and we don't want it um, because it will bind us to do work that, that will take away even more from our core purpose. Um, and yeah, so we, we are completely dependent for funding on, on our international donors. And I think another thing for me that we've been trying to work on for a while and then gave up again, was to facilitate real meaningful dialogue between frontline workers or frontline organizations and their, their funding partners. Um, and to kind of deconstruct some of those power relations. I think we are in a, in an era of very conservative, um, almost right wing um, ways of, of um, in which accountability is demanded from us with actually very little interest in, in what's going on on the ground level. And I don't, mean, I don't mean the individual organizations, but who they then account to, the governments that they account to. Um, so I think, if we can get some real dialogue between funding agencies and frontline organizations and who then also then challenge the power structures that define um, how aid and, and support is distributed and what is, what is collective responsibility and what is partnership. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of things we have to think about and digest. Um, we, we, we uh, are running out of time. And um, so I want to say goodbye and thank you again very much. And thank you to all our participants who joined us and please yeah, give feedback if you still want. And thank you to Julia to facilitating the questions and the chat. And a special thank you to our interpreters, Miriam Sojino and Ilolo Avono. I think you did an incredible job. I know that is hard to do that in the back, but thank you very much. Okay, bye. Thank you for having us. And I hope you have some quiet time, all of you at the Saturday. Okay, bye-bye.